So, so I'll have a bit of the second session. We will have Professor Yoram Yoven, the professor of the guy there, under the title of Subjective Experience and Objective Experience. We will start with Professor Yoram Yoven. Okay, um, so thank you, Matan and Eva, for, for inviting me. It's, it's really a great honor uh, to be here. And uh, among the distinguished speakers that are speaking with us today, I have uh, two of my former mentors uh, from, from Professor Zendai. I learned about uh, learning and memory. And uh, from Professor Abelis, I learned about renal physiology. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I'm, it's, it's really an honor. Uh, I'm going to get to that. Uh, so um, I know that I'm speaking after lunch. So I probably should be somewhat uh, animated and try to engage you, um, the, the audience, in, in my talk, which is what I'm going to try to do uh, in the hope of keeping you awake. Uh, so, so let's begin. First of all, I'll re reiterate what you've uh, heard before, and that is what, what the requests to us have been, the questions that the organizers uh, have asked us, you know, one theory discovery, which one would we choose, what would you consider as a major breakthrough, uh, what is the right direction uh, and, and, and why, um, and is there a right direction? So, as I told you a little bit earlier, and now it saves me the time, I think you will find that most of us talk about uh, what we know how to do and what uh, we went into doing, and we'll try to show you through the arrow with the target that this is really the future of, of brain research. Um, I think we have a tendency to do that, certainly, uh, I think that's what I'm going to do. But I think that's not been shared with you before is that when uh, Matan and Eva contacted us and, and sent us directives for, for um, how we should prepare for this, they added the, the following request. They said, it would be better if each of you would present the radical point of view of his side. <laughs> so, so that's what I'm going to start by doing. I'm going to present the, 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 the radical uh, uh, point of view of my side, and I'm actually going to do it in a single word. Okay. And that is a word that, in English, it, 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 it's a four-letter word. And, and I think it might come as a four-letter word to, to some of us here, but I'm going to say it in Hebrew. In Hebrew, it only has three letters, but I think it carries more of the punch of what, what I'm going to say. So, uh, as I said, I'll begin with a radical word. And this is the radical word. Okay? Okay. Um, if you had to choose one theory or discovery from, from the history of, of brain research that has great influence, which one would you choose? I would say that the one that we would choose would depend on what we think is the goal of brain research. Where should brain research be going? And uh, here you see the pictures of, of two important individuals. By the way, let, let's start with patient recognition. This is Al Turing. Yes. And who is this one? This is Kenneth Craig. Shared, um, he, he was he, he's two years younger than, than Alan Turing. He shared Cambridge with him. Like uh, Turing, he died a very tragic death as, as a young man. And uh, he had a book in 1943 called The Nature of Explanation, in which he proposed the idea of the brain as a computing machine, which, which uh, uh, Turing uh, is picked up and expanded on. And indeed, um, I think that if uh, um, uh, you think that understanding the brain and mind as a computing machine, which is what Alan Turing uh, did, then you get one, one line of discoveries or theories or findings that it would be important in, in, in brain science. Um, however, um, I do not, I personally do not think that, that this is the ultimate goal of, of brain research, to understand the brain and mind as a computing machine. So I think that puts me in a very dubious position uh, with regard to this uh, Center for, for Neural Computation. Uh, and that is not to say that it's not important to understand the brain as, as, as uh, um, a computing machine. Because the brain really is a, a, a wonderful, elaborate, sophisticated computing machine. But I would say that this is not its salient or most important feature, although it is definitely a feature of the brain. The most salient or important feature of the brain, in my opinion, is that it is the organ of the mind. And I'm saying in Hebrew, because I think it's important, Hamoach Uivar Hanefesh. This is the most salient, important characteristic of the brain. I think this is what we need to focus on. Yadid said that, that people, when people start uh, to get close to their retirement, they start talking about consciousness. I must be very close to my retirement, <laughs> because I really talk to you. 
about consciousness. I will try to show you that it's not that far-fetched, that in my opinion, we can actually uh, uh, do some experiments that, in my opinion, would advance us further towards understanding the foundations of consciousness. Okay. Um, so, so, I will again state the obvious, that minds, like brains, are, are, are part of nature. And I would say a very poorly understood part of nature, but they are part of nature. What else would they be? They could be nothing else. And brain research, especially the future of brain research, in my opinion, should, should reflect this fact. And therefore, in my opinion, uh, the goal is not to, to understand the brain as a computing machine, although that's important and should be done, but rather the goal is to understand the brain as the organ of the mind. But if the goal of brain research is, is to understand how the brain gives rise to the mind, then we're immediately confronted by the mind-brain problem. And we're stating the problem in, in, in these terms. The how subjective experience is related to objective brains. Okay. I, I don't think I have to tell you that uh, the, the, the mind-body problem is, is, is indeed a very old problem. Um, it has been dealt with extensively over the last 2,500 years. Um, and I would say that until the 19th century, the, the mind-body problem was the, the exclusive domain of philosophers. And I would say that the main reason for that is that um, the, there simply were no ways to, to, to investigate the role of the brain as the organ of the mind in any direct fashion. And that began to change in, in I would say, the mid-19th century. Um, and since then, in my opinion, great advances actually have been made on the road to understanding the brain uh, as the organ of the mind. Um, and I would say that, that many, many gifted individuals have contributed discoveries and great theories, and uh, I would agree here with Yazim that we can change theories with models. I mean, these would be not only models of the brain, but necessarily also models of the mind, you know, to help us understand the nature of the brain, the nature of the mind, and their interrelationship. Um, okay, so um, it, I think like, like many of the other speakers before me, I also agree that there's no one discovery, that there's no single discovery. So I would like to show you um, um, some of the people and some of the discoveries involved that, in my opinion, go in the direction that uh, I find the most uh, important and salient in, in brain research, and that is understanding the role of the brain as the organ of the mind. And I was, I was very pleased in, in, um, by, by the idea that uh, my son and, and Eva had to, to pair the, the, the speakers with each other, um, you know, to, to present us in two. And in, in, that, in that spirit, I'm going to, to present to you the, the, the people that I think have uh, expanded us, and expanded our knowledge, advanced us um, on, the road to, on the road to understanding the brain and mind uh, in pairs. So this is the first pair. So, so who are these? That's Charles Darwin, yes, and, and Paul Broca. Right, so these are, these are Charles Darwin and Paul Broca. You'll tell me if you find that they look a little bit like each other or not. This is... This is this is how it struck me. But these, these are two individuals that I think advanced us. These are two other ones. Who are these? Barry. That's Roger Sperry and uh, John Ewing Jackson, okay. who again had a very elaborate model of the mind that I think is, is and the brain that I think is still useful. You know. um, another important pair. Um, I was very pleased to see that the Chow uh, mentioned Sigmund Freud. I think he had very important models of the mind, you know, that we still find useful, not because everything is right, many things are wrong, but there are some main ideas, you know, for example, the idea of the unconscious, they are certainly very useful, I think generally accepted today in modern neuroscience, although Freud himself is not. Who's the other gentleman? That's Kahal, yeah. Okay, another, another pair. So this is, this is Charles Sherrington, you know, the inventor, the, the finder of the, the synapse. And Wilder Penfield, who, who did experiments that I think are, are very instructive, you know, in stimulating the brain directly in, in uh, uh, awake patients who reported to him what they were feeling and thinking and experiencing as he did that. And, and uh, another couple that I think are important if you want to understand the brain as the organ of the mind, who are these? So, so this is Conrad Lawrence, okay? And this is Alexander Romanovich Luria. You know, there's a Soviet neurologist, and uh, really the first neuropsychologist, uh, who generate, I think, also a very, very useful model of the mind that correlates to a lot of what we know about the brain now. And just to show that it's not only things that happened um, a long time ago. Here's another couple. Uh, they even got the Nobel Prize the same year. Um, 
on, on uh, the right there is, is my mentor, uh, Professor Eric Kandel, and uh, on the left is Professor Armin Carlson from Sweden, who, who got the Nobel Prize for being the first to understand how a psychiatric drug, any psychiatric drug, actually works. You know? So I'm sure that this would be something that um, uh, would be uh, pleasing to Haggai, who speaks after me, but he is one of the main uh, proponents of the do dopamine hypothesis of psychosis. So, I have to say, so these, these uh, individuals, as well as many, many others that I have not uh, uh, included here, I think they advance our understanding of, of how uh, the brain gives rise to the mind. And I should only caution you that the how here, you know, so that we didn't understand at all um, whether uh, how the brain gives rise to the mind is still under the debate. I think that, that we did. But there are many people, especially along the philosophy camp, that believe that we have not understood anything about the how. Okay. Um, again, looking at, at uh, images, who, who is this guy? <coughs> is he an aging rock star? No. He's, he's probably the most prominent neurophilosopher uh, of, of our age. I'm sure you guys have heard uh, his name, at least some of you. Uh, this is David Chalmers. And David Chalmers, just to, to show you, he's a mathematician, he's a role scholar, he did his PhD with Hofstadter, uh, he was the director of the Center of Consciousness Studies at the University in the University of Arizona, um, and, and Chalmers in the mid-90s advanced a theory that I think, uh, or rather a conceptualization of the mind-brain problem that I think many of us in the neurosciences find very useful. And his approach, which actually um, did something new or something nice in the mind-brain problem, which is a very ancient and somewhat repetitive problem, was to divide the mind-brain problem into two problems, one that he called the easy problem and the other that he called hard problem. And um, to, to Chalmers, the easy problem is the following. It is, what are the neural processes that are associated with consciousness? Again, assuming that consciousness is the defining, the salient feature you know, of the brain, that the brain is the organ of the mind, and the mind is distinguished by, consciousness, by its consciousness, then we want to know what are the neural processes that are associated with consciousness. And that is a task of correlation. And the whole, the whole movement about the, the neural correlates of consciousness, the NPCs, goes in, into that, that goal. But, um, said uh, uh, Chandra, there's also a different problem, which he called the hard problem. And that is the problem of how do neural processes make us conscious. This is a problem of causality. Many, many people, actually myself uh, included, that think that we've made great strides uh, along the, the road to understanding the easy problem, but that we have not advanced at all along the road to understanding the hard problem. But there remains a question of whether the hard problem actually exists. Uh, Yadin asked me to, to um, um, mention my grandfather, so, so I do. My grandfather, uh, Professor Ishaya Libowitz, was uh, one of the people who thought that we will never solve the mind brain problem because he thought that the hard, he didn't use those terms, but he, he thought that the, the hard problem is inherently unsolvable. Okay? But I have to say that we have to be careful about this. Okay? And the reason why we have to be careful about this is because science has a long tradition of solving problems that at first seem unsolvable. And one um, important um, um, uh, example like that, which was solved in our lifetime, and it was solved quietly, and it was solved without much ado, again, because it was not the outcome of a single discovery of a single person, but the, the, the cumulative works of, of literally thousands of scientists throughout the world working on different levels with different methodologies, and that is the question of life. Okay? Because until very recently, it was um, uh, popular, and this is the way how uh, people conceptualize it, is that there is an easy problem and a hard problem of life. People distinguish between the mechanisms like the biochemical, physiological mechanisms that support life, and the quality of life itself. Okay, people, uh, it is Newton and after it, and as I said, also my grandfather thought that there's something is, is that life is different from the mechanisms uh, that, that that support life. And what we found, we found this in our lifetime, is that once we have explained in a sufficient degree of detail the easy problem, that is, once we have accounted for, for most of the of the um, uh, mechanisms that that support life, the hard problem seems to go away. There is no hard problem to understand. I think it's safe to say that at this point we have understood life. You know, we don't know all the details, but we have good working models. We can reconstruct theoretically 
we, we um, put our energies to it, we could build a bacterium if we really wanted to, and it would function, and we would have an account for everything that that bacterium does, including more taxes, including very important things. So the hard problem of life seems to, to, to have evaporated once we explain the easy problem. Maybe that's going to happen um, uh, with a hard problem, maybe not. But um, I think that you should be wary in, in terms of, of, of gaps in our levels of understanding that there is a huge gap, the one that we like to call the explanatory gap between uh, the brain and, and its function and our subjective first-person experience. That, that there's a true gap there, and I, I would uh, argue with, with Moshe that this is where the real gap is, in, 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 in my opinion, in our understanding of the brain as the organ of the mind. So I think that we should we should definitely mind the gap. <laughs> okay, okay. So the, the uh, next question that, that was asked by by the organizers is: What would I consider a major breakthrough in in brain research today? Uh, what is the right direction, and what is there a right uh, uh, is there a right direction? And I would say that the right direction, in my opinion, would be the direction that best help us understand as soon as possible how the brain re gives rise to the mind, you know, going back to those, to those uh, neural correlates of consciousness. Uh, now, I want to, to mention, and, and Shaul already did that before me, that uh, mind does not equal consciousness. You know, I used to, when I prepared the slide, I put another, beside the slide of David Chambers, I had a little, a, a little photo of, of Sigmund Freud here, but then I thought it would be too much and I removed it. You know? uh, but what I wanted to say is that there is definite evidence to, to, to that, that mind does not equal consciousness. The unconscious is definitely mental, it's definitely part of our mind, but I'm going to ignore that for now. Um, I don't know whether a hard problem of consciousness really exists uh, once we solve the easy problem. Uh, actually, I suspect that we do, but I don't know. I'm not sure. But I will say this, and I think most neuroscientists would have to agree with me, and that is that either way, uh, whether we like it or not, I think that we're stuck investigating the easy problem of consciousness, with the hope that this will one day help us understand the heart problem consciousness or help us discover that it's better away as, as, as uh, we look for it. Okay, so let's go back to the easy problem. What are the neural processes that are associated with consciousness? And again, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about relations. Uh, so we've already met Alan Turing. Uh, uh, he certainly wanted to do that. We know that the easy problem is, is anything but easy. It, 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 in and of itself, it is very hard. Uh, now, many neuroscientists who see the brain as a computing machine uh, also believe that consciousness is generated by or emerges from the joint activity of, of billions of interconnected neural neurons in the cerebral neocortex. Okay. And what I would like to suggest is that this might not be the best way to study how the brain gives rise to the mind. I want to say it again because it's important. In my opinion, studying the, the concerted uh, uh, activity of, of assembly billions of neurons in the cerebral cortex is not the best way to go at this point in time to understanding the mechanisms of consciousness. And here's the reason why. Uh, consciousness is, is characterized by three distinct features. Here I'm quoting again two neurophilosophers, two prominent neurophilosophers, um, um, Thomas Nagel and John Searle, and they, uh, so consensually, they and, and other neurophilosophers consensually agree that the consciousness is, is characterized three distinct properties that should be The first is subjectivity, and that is it is sensory quality, a subjective feeling, a subjective experience that we have. The other is internality, or, or will, which is associated with something more, something that we want, something that we need towards. And I agree with you that these, these two phrases, at the current state of our knowledge, are impossible to phrase in, in the definitions of the sciences, I'll say this again, that at this stage of our knowledge, we do not have the vocabulary, we do not have the tools to adequately define these things in, in criteria from the natural sciences. The third quality, which we're beginning to do, is the, the, what uh, they call unity, and I think we will call it the property of binding, which you've already heard about uh, here today, which I think is, is, is somewhat easier to, to, to construe. But these two are, are, are tough, tough things to crack. Um, and the question is, can we explain subjectivity, that is, I see, and intentionality, that is, I want? Um, and subjectivity and intentionality in, in their basic forms are probably sub -cortical. Again, I'll say this once more because uh, it's important. The subjectivity and intentionality, at least in, in their most basic forms, are probably sub 
neocortical. We should not look for the most basic aspects of these things in the cortex. Um, and here, here is another couple uh, that, that some of you may know. This is uh, Antonio Damasio, and this is Jacques Pancher, who in 1992 first coined the phrase uh, affective neuroscience. Obviously, I think that he's doing something very important, so I'm going to be talking about what, what these people have done or are doing and, and try to show you how it relates to understanding consciousness. Um, first is, is when we talk about subjectivity, are we talking about conscious awareness? I would say that in the first approximation, that is probably the case. That it, it, it would be fair if we want to talk about uh, subjectivity, we can talk about conscious awareness. And one thing that is clearly true from both preclinical and clinical studies is that conscious awareness is not a unitary phenomenon. And that is something that sometimes the philosophers and, and those scientists who have not been neuroscientists but came to study NPCs after the got of the prize don't always understand that consciousness is not unitary. Um, and uh, the, the ideas of level and he generally divides consciousness between core consciousness, okay, and uh, which is non-verbal and non-reflexive, and extended consciousness, which is verbal, introspective, and communicated, etc., etc. Um, actually, it does something very similar, you know, in his affective neuroscience. Um, he talks about the raw feeling, how things feel, and, and cognitive consciousness, which is more of what we usually relate to. Putting them into words, reasoning about them, etc. Affective consciousness may be the most basic form of consciousness, and I want to show you that we we actually do do think or do do behave at least as if that were the case, because uh, many of us do experiment in animals, and before we do to the animals things that that are highly aversive, you know, we try if we at all can to anesthetize them, and some of you might is that they will not move while we cut them up. But I don't think that's why most of us do it. Most of us do it because we don't want them to feel pain. And that means that we believe that somewhere in that animal there is a subjectivity, <coughs> there, is a, there is a being, there is something that can experience pain and we want to That is the kind of consciousness, that we have. a very basic, very raw consciousness that you don't need to have a cortex in order to feel. Um, so I said, emotions are primarily uh, subneocortical, and I would say then, and, and uh, uh, Shaul talked about um, um, modeling a mouse. What would happen if we would, would uh, completely model a mouse? Uh, obviously, one goal of neurocomputation is, is to do a complete model of, of, of the human brain, and uh, I think we all know about the Turing test, and I would, I would suggest to you that in order for <coughs> computers to truly pass the Turing test, they will have to be and I would say something more about that. that is that this might happen sooner than we think. Okay? That this is not such a far-fetched goal, and I don't want to be a prophet, but maybe that it will happen, I don't think in my lifetime, but perhaps in the lifetimes of, of some of the people that are sitting here and still have their hair. Um, Um, she was uh, 
placed a normal uh, baby in her hand, and then, you know, again, she, obviously she cannot talk. You know, one can argue that, that all these things are reflexive and, and, and uh, you know, represent nothing, um, and that there's no actual feeling uh, behind it. And this would be the philosophical problem of other minds. How do we know that someone else actually has a mind and feeling like we do? But I would say that most people would argue, and certainly our ethics argue, that there is some creature there who's capable of feeling something, you know, and, and maybe even experiencing primitive pleasure and displeasure, you know, and I would argue that the majority of the evidence suggests that in order to do that, you don't even have to have a limbic system. It's enough that you have an intact periaqueductal brain. Okay, so what about the periaqueductal brain? Uh, it's the lowest region of, of the neuroaxis for which we have abundant evidence for emotional subjective experiences. That, that Emotional experiences in this tiny structure. Um, and so, what, what, what is the evidence that the period of the brain might be one of the important structures that, that underlie core consciousness, the affected consciousness? The first is one that I've already showed you that the lowest uh, amount of, of electrical stimulation is needed to obtain emotional feelings and actions in, in the brain. The second is this is the small area of the brain that uh, needs to be knocked out in order to completely obliterate consciousness. I don't know if you know this, but I can take out one of your hemispheres in, in total, or one of my hemispheres, cerebral hemispheres, and your consciousness will not be affected. You will certainly be very different, but you will not lose consciousness, and you will uh, continue to be in, in contact with consciousness on a compromised level. The, the period of the brain is... The size uh, of, of my fingernail. That area of the brain uh, is, 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 is um, irreversibly damaged, as it did to our ex prime minister. Then consciousness goes away um, um, completely. It's like shutting off the light. And if that area is completely destroyed, no one has ever come back in consciousness from that. And um, the third, which is direct, is it's the most massive inclusion site of, of, of different systems along along the know from animal experiments as well as experiments in humans that the periodic makes capable of generating a feelings of pleasure and pleasure. Okay, so we can talk about effective neuroscience, uh factors that you already know. Uh the person on the someone recognize them? The person on the right? So that's James uh, papers and, and he's I think of all former he's the one with the most difficult name want to figure out the difference how to pronounce uh, papers. Of course, he is the one who, who proposed the picture. And I would say to you that if you want to understand, I feel we should be studying the picture of Dr. Gray. Because this is the, this, not because this is the homologous of the eye, but this is a neural structure that together with other neural structures has a key role in generating what we experience as a first person subjectivity. Okay. Um, the, the, uh, if you want to understand, the amygdala, the cingulate, the insular cortex, the ganglia. If we want to understand one, okay, then we should study dopamine. That is that the facts of uh, seeking. And I would like just to mention how these things are relevant to I'm sure Hagar is going to talk about this. Um, the most I can for example, CBT, depression, anxiety, ADHD, bipolar disorder, unfortunate psychosis, are all associated. Probably most in the brain core emotional systems, those, those are mixed systems. And uh, I think it's uh, a good place uh, to stop, mostly because we have a lot of time. We turn this over to Hassan. There's one, one concluding remark that I have. And that is uh, about um, about us and about feelings. Uh, um, I think many of us, most of us, are uh, too experimental in animals. And I think that uh, experiments in animals both are justified and necessary. But I think Understand, and I think now there's overwhelming evidence to show this is not true, but to support the idea that animals, especially animals, especially humans who are close to us, share the same basic raw, affective, emotional, subjective experiences as we do, I would suggest that there's ample evidence to suggest that, that's direct evidence. Then the issue of, of uh, uh, doing experiments with them uh, comes up again 
and it is a huge more problem. So I don't think that we should not do experiments in animals, but I think because they are so closely related to us in terms of the core affected feelings, I think that A, we should acknowledge this fact, acknowledge that there is a, a, a moral issue here, and second, I think we should be very careful. Thank you very much. Thank you all for coming. Thank you, Rabbi Nathan, for organizing it. And uh, of course, it is very easy for me to take the point of take the radical point of view. So I will try to do it. Uh, and uh, although I agree with some of the things that was uh, done before, especially by Yoram, but by the other speaker, I disagree with many of them. And I, I would like to go. I try to go over them while I'm speaking. So uh, the question that we are trying to, for uh, one, we are uh, very uh, uh, obeying uh, people and we see this kind of question. And still, although Yoram was uh, doing it, I think that he, for example, ignored the question this, what is the right direction? How is the best person? <laughs> okay. But uh, it's not practical enough. So I will try to go to, to the point. What is so, uh, if you have to choose one to discovery from the story of Brunsight, uh, uh, which one you choose? So, I agree with the Nelson Doctrine, but I think that the second one is what I call the Spike doc Doctrine of uh, uh, Edgar Adler. And I think that these two uh, discoveries together give us the core element of the computational in the brain, okay? And the core element in the space is the single neuron, and the core element in time is the single spike, okay? And of course, we have to understand molecular biology, and we have to understand cardiovascular physiology, and respiratory physiology, and renal physiology, so we have to understand everything, but if our question is to understand the computational machinery of the brain, and hopefully, to solve the hard problem of consciousness, but enough for me to solve the easy, the easy problem, okay? Then we have to say to ourselves, what are the core elements? Because we cannot do everything, okay? And if this is, this is what we are going to do, then the most important discovery are the discovery of the neuron as the, thing, as the core element in space, and the spike as the core element in time. Then, Okay, the second question was, what would you consider as a major breakthrough in brain research today, okay? And, and the students over here know, of course, I'm, I'm doing uh, this is exactly because uh, I, I should do it, okay? Uh, this is uh, clearly what I, I do. It. But I think that, uh, again, for me, this uh, discovery, this physiological and computational together, that it was done by, initially by the recording of dopaminergic neuron by were from Schultz, and then the insight that was given to this recording by Peter Dayan, that say that actually if we look at the reactivity of the energetic neuron, we will think that they may predict pleasure, that is when we give to the monkey and reward, then the dopaminergic neuron increase the fire, but then actually when we can show that if we train the monkey that there is a conditioning simply that predict reward, we we'll see activity only for the patient's pain and not for the reward. And finally, if we omit this reward, the dopaminergic system will uh, encode this disappointment by reduction of the firing. That is, dopaminergic reward encode the mismatch between patient and reality. And to make a big story, actually, and now this is my interpretation, we can say that the the area of all biological creatures has been shaped by evolution to maximize the forward of their gain to the next generation. Okay? This is my working assumption that we have been shaped by evolution. The, the goal, the functional goal of evolution is to remove as more as possible gene to the next generation. Richard Dawkins. Okay? Biological problem is the problem that the feedback that we are getting from the environment is incomplete is delayed, okay, only now that uh, not ever know the mistake that your show was doing when she invited me and she has to come
back. <laughs> and so on. So, so we have an incomplete figure coming from the government, and the environment is noisy, and the rules are changing. And therefore, actually, in order to uh, accomplish the goal, the biology goal of moving more G to the next generation, we cannot trust the primary reinforcement. Actually, our system is doing like this, that we use the dopamine system, and the dopamine system all the time calculating the mistake between religion and reality. And to make a long story short, your primary goal in life is to maximize the cumulative amount of dopamine in your brain. So first issue that I completely don't agree with is that you understand your behavior, you have to understand the cortex. Here I completely agree with Yoram that we should cortex in a small part of the brain, okay? And but, <laughs> but, but, to understand really the major driver of behavior, we have to go to the basal ganglia and to the dopamine system and we'll show it later, okay? So what is the right direction for research and why? So for, for it depends on what are your goal, and uh, if you don't have any goal, then you should, should not do anything. And for me, the goal, okay, is the easy, the easy problem of your arm is to understand the brain and the mind as a computing machine. I do believe that if this easy goal will be achieved in probably 1,000 years from now, 10,000 years from now, you know, easy goal, okay, then the art problem will be solved. But anyway, it is not a problem, okay? So I am <laughs> I, I'm living with this, uh, this is my goal, okay? And then the most promising technical level is that you have to understand the building elements of the brain computer machine are the spike of single neuron, okay? So again, it is not that molecular biology is not important. It is not that... Functional MRI is not important, but if we are trying to understand the system, we should tell ourselves what are the core elements, and the core elements are the, uh, the spikes of single neuron. And then, what is the most critical brain area to study? Is it the cortex? Is it the, the PAG? Okay, or it is the basal ganglia? So of course, you know that the, the answer is the uh, core. Is since the goal of life is to maximize cumulative dopamine in your brain, and most of your dopamine in your brain is in basal ganglia, then the system to look for is basal ganglia and the dopamine system. And then the, and then the question is, okay, you, you said that you're being this trick, so clearly you overkill with this assumption that this very, very small, small molecule, dopamine, is the goal of your life. And I think that we have very good evidence to show, to tell you that dopamine is really the main driver of human, of human and biological behavior, okay? And, and first of all, that elevation of dopamine level is the final common pathway of most, maybe all, drug of addiction. There is a story of electrical stimulation, electrical self-stimulation. If I put now electrode in your brain properly, and I will enable you to stimulate your dopamine, and to release more dopamine to your brain, you will not be interested in what I'm speaking now, you will not be interested in food, and you will even skip sex in order to directly stimulate uh, your dopamine system. Most, actually, it was already mentioned that if we lose our dopamine, we get Parkinson's disease, and clearly the drug that we are using today for most mental disorder, starting with with depression and schizophrenia are related to the dopamine system. Okay? So I think that, yes, we overkill with this saying that dopamine is the only goal of your life, but for a first order of approximation, this is where you should start. After you understand in 10,000 years from now everything about the dopamine system, then you can move to the 5 you can, you can move to the other system, but if you have to start, you have start where the big get is, is there, and I think that it is in the dopamine system. So either is the right direction, and of course uh, there is a right direction. So it, it, it depends on your on, on, on your goal. 
So if your long range goal is to understand human brain and mind, okay? But I think that this is not really the most important goal. I think that the most important goal of people, smart people like you, is to use this knowledge in order to do something. So I don't agree with the thing that those who do know it is that those who, those who do are those that recreate the brain. Those who do are those that give some cure and some hope to human patient with disease that we don't are unable to treat today as society. And again, uh, this is uh, uh, from last year in, uh, uh, I think, uh, Ynet or, or Aretz. So uh, the Ministry of uh, Health, or what, who is supposed to be the Ministry of Health in, in our place, have, have done a visit to one of the mental hospitals in Jerusalem and said that if it was up to him, he would close. And I should tell you, this is the, the picture. This is the picture. I've been this Friday in Etanim, okay? It is the, another uh, mental hospital. There is also a bed over here, okay? So in this small room, smaller than this, five patients are closed for three, three months, one year, so are not coming for three days, in this terrible bed, in this terrible situation, with a toilet that you will not enter, and you, a society, Wasting your time on learning excitation inhibition balance in the cortex, okay? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, doing some kind of uh, games with mathematics where there are one percent of the population starting their schizophrenic symptoms at the age of 25 and you only give them anti-psychotic treatment that, that ameliorate their positive symptoms so they are not homeless, they are not shouting in the street but they are sitting over there, or in the best case, in hostels, actually completely divided from you. So if you would like to do something, okay, if you would like to do, to use the huge amount of IQ that is distributed over the river, okay, you should do something with this. And again, I think that every time, every, the most important question that a PhD student, when he's selected his level of research, ask himself, do I think that what I'm doing will help anybody sometime? Again, just think about it, okay? It probably will be wrong, but the question is, again, do I do something that might end in some help to patients that need it, okay? And the way to close hospitals is actually the way that you find a cure to the disease. This is the way that <coughs> hospitals for the poor, for Kulevi, for Shachefet, for Sarat, we are closed. If you will find a cure for the disease, then this hospital will not be needed. So uh, this is my last slide. I'm really on time. So yes, there is the right direction, and the right direction is to record in, the record the study of many cell neurons in the basal ganglia and the related structure. And the related structure, from my point of view, is also the PEG. But again, I think this is this is a small argument. Okay. The, ma the major issue, again, is uh, to record the spike activity, the spike activity of many neurons in the area that really shape your behavior. And what I've shown you, that this area really shapes your behavior, and do it in normal in order to understand what the system does in the normal state, and use this no and then in dopamine depleted, Parkinson, and dopamine overexcited, probably schizophrenia, if we believe in the dopamine model of schizophrenia, be having privacy. And again, very, very, this is last issue for your own. Okay? Yes, we are very, very aware that we should be very, very ethical and experimental on monkey. But keep in mind that it is much more easy to experiment on human patients. Okay? And every time, okay, all those people that don't let us do experimental on monkey actually push us to experiment on human. So have this ethical question in mind and make your own decision and uh, thank you for your attention. So uh, thank you, Hagai. It's uh, it's nice to know on how many things we agree. You know. <laughs>
even even on this uh, on this uh, I, I I do agree. With it. Almost everything that you said. Let, let me reiterate what what I think we do. Uh, I think that the experiments that you guys are doing are fine. I just think that as a discipline, you know, we have tended to shy away from subjective experience. I think it's not a coincidence that all the the, the very distinguished speakers, you know, who have presented to us before now, have not mentioned in any degree of of um, um, uh, And I think that the reason why we have to take subjective experience into account is because if we don't, I think that we are reduction by, by necessity. I think that, that uh, science uh, operates not only top down, you know, but also bottom up. And I think breaking things into simpler uh, building blocks is, is essential for us to, to progress. But if we don't take the, if we take subjectivity into account, we are going to find simple models that mimic a behavior and go on from there and, and go and make false turns. And one uh, example for that, which I think relates to, to dopamine and other aminic neurons, is the study of dreams. I think most of you probably learned in, in the introduction to in psychology that, that um, dreams are really REM sleep. That's not true. You know, dreams are dreams and REM sleep are REM sleep. They're totally dissociable. We now know that because we were so eager to study dreams, uh, um, uh, scientifically, biologically, since, and since many dreams occur while we have REM sleep, people have made the jump and then stopped looking at, at the subjective experience of people saying that they have dreams and, and looked into, into REM sleep. And I don't know if you know this, but actually it's something that is very relevant to dopamine, but the, the, the terrible surgery that was done, the experiment on people, which is um, uh, 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 frontal recotomy, the, 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 what they call lobotomy, what um, um, they did in uh, one jump of the Google's Nash, this is what happened to um, Jack Nicholson, that the, the, the ascending um, fibers to the front of the And when that happens to individuals, they don't stop. They feel dreaming. And once we went and read the reports from the 50s of the neurosurgeons, we found that they wrote there that if the patient is running still dreaming, it means that the operation has failed. You know? So this is what we get if we stop looking at subjective experience. So, so what kind of experiment do you do in order to learn about the experiment? I'll give you the practical question. I'll, I'll give you an example. Okay. This is, you know, I, I do experiments with people. You know? What I'm involved in now is treating people who are suicidal with pain medications. You know? Because we have the evidence that subjective mental pain is the hallmark that the short-term um, determining factor of whether a person is going to commit suicide but rather their subjective report of their mental pain and we have, you know, legal
you will be able to solve it, then what you will do then after, okay? <laughs> Break from being able to solve, at least on the level of the, the easy problem, to solve the question of what are the core neural circuits that produce the key uh, basic elements of consciousness. And I, I think that this might happen in the lifetime of, of at least other people here. So I don't think it's that. And, and you are problem? Hmm? And you are problem? I don't know if it's soluble. No, in, in all reality, I don't. I think we should act as if it is in the, and keep going. But if you ask me, I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. yeah, I, I would like to. Ask of the best to clarify, to try to clarify what we call uh, uh, you are, uh, the easy and hard problems. Because at some point you 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 find the hard, the easy problem as the neural correlates, as the association between neural uh, patterns of activity or neural circuits uh, and uh, uh, and consciousness. Uh, and 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 then the hard problem was uh, how or the problem. Uh, but then. Uh, as you said, uh, you, you are mostly focused on the easy problems, but actually, if I understand correctly, the last part of your research is not simply correlation, but actually what we will call a finding causal relation between them. So you are actually solving the hard problem. And I think that there is a, the hard problem is, should be defined differently. In my view, both correlation, but also causal relations between neural qualities, between neural patterns of activity and the mind are easy in the sense that they are in principle uh, can be uh, addressed by, <coughs> by the scientific method as we recognize it today. I think the real hard problem is, whether it exists, is the first person aspect of, uh, of consciousness, which by definition, by definition, is not accessible to any experiment, to, to nobody, not, not the outside I, outside me. And, and if this if this really is something that it exists, then by definition, it is not accessible to neuroscience. Okay. So, first of all, I do agree with you about the hard problem. I'm not sure if it's insoluble, but I want to clarify um, what you said about the easy problem. The easy problem is a question of correlation. It doesn't mean there's no causality. Experiments that show causal relationships between biological events and mental events are as easy as any of us having a beer. You know, if, if we a beer and then our mood elevates, you know, we have used ethanol, it's even a, a simpler uh, molecule than dopamine, you know, and we have grossly changed our subjective experience. This is why we serve alcohol at parties, so we can get all and start talking to each other. Exactly, exactly. It does increase, it does increase. The um, so, so, of course, we can do causal experiments. With you. All, all, all of pharmacology is doing causal experiments and making changes in, in, in mental events, but that doesn't mean we understand it. How that happens, what you call the first person experience, how any occurrence within any set of neurons generates any kind of first person experience, that is the what real hard problem. Uh, no, first, but what about this is the how question is you can ask about any physical phenomenon. Yeah, no, no, but I'm asking about the subjective first hand experience. And what you're saying is that it's insoluble. And you might be right, I'm not sure at all it's soluble. I'm just saying if you look at the problem of life, we used to think that it's soluble, and then it just went I away. So I don't think it exists. I think the causal and full, full understanding of the causal relation, the causal relation, how subjective experience emerges from the brain is something which neuroscience or science can actually uh, explain. Uh, if there is something which, as I said, by definition is outside the science, if there is something like that, then of course no science is not. But why is, why is the problem of consciousness unique? Do you understand really what is the law of gravity? I think so. You think so? Yeah. I, I, I don't understand. I'm a biologist. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I would yeah. argue with you that it's not very near. But, but I don't care about the law of gravity. <laughs> 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 just, uh, I just want to add one comment. We are really out of time. But I, don't, I just want to make sure that everybody understands that not all of us believe that single molecule, no matter what it is, can be the goal of life. <laughs> 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 I personally don't believe that if we dump in dopamine, I'll, be, I'll get the uh, 
to have it. <laughs> Maybe very quickly, but actually there must be something else, and I believe it's, it's a much more abstract concept of information, but this is another talk. <laughs> okay, let's go. Okay, this is only the beginning of a uh, heated discussion, but we have to move on. So let's uh, thank the speakers again.